Welcome to another episode of Historically Speaking. I'm your host, Michael Dwyer, and our topic this time is Prohibition in Vermont. My story about Prohibition begins with a personal connection. In the image on the left, I am holding my grandmother Dwyer's decanter. Through her lifetime, this was filled on her night table, and I knew as a child that it was filled with something. I later discovered it was brandy. What's interesting about this in Prohibition is that my grandmother claimed that she was a temperance advocate. So how could she have a decanter of brandy on her bedside? And I later learned that Nana only drank brandy for medicinal purposes. And to underscore some of the contradictions and the paradoxes of the time that we know is prohibition, on the right-hand side, we have a photo of my grandparents' wedding in 1929. The last survivor of this quartet was my grandmother's adopted sister, Margaret, who is the young woman at the left of the photo. When I had the opportunity to interview Margaret in the early 1990s and just ask her to tell me family stories, she told me the story of the wedding reception. And she said that Uncle Frank, my grandfather's brother, who was at the right of the photo, he was the man who got all the booze. And I said, Aunt Margaret, what do you mean the booze? This is during the time of prohibition. I didn't think anyone was drinking. What did my grandmother have to say to that? The sad thing about prohibition and what actually happened is that most people, if not all people, who have direct memories of what happened during Prohibition are long gone. And as I delved into this investigation, like my own family's complexity during the time of Prohibition, I found that the story of Prohibition in Vermont did not begin with the 18th Amendment in 1919. The story has roots much deeper in Victorian society. Vermont from 1852 until 1902, a period of more than 50 years, was a dry state. In 1852, an act passed by the legislature was to prevent traffic in intoxicating liquors for the purpose of drinking. And I quote from the Rutland Herald, a passage from that act. No person shall be allowed at any time or place within this state, except as hereinafter provided, to manufacture, sell, furnish, give away by himself, his clerk, servant, or agent, any spirituous or intoxicating liquor or mixed liquor of which a part is spirituous or intoxicating, which is intended by the phrase intoxicating liquor. And then, of course, the exception to this, the act shall be, cons the, nothing in this act shall be construed to prevent the manufacture, sale, and use of the fruit of the vine for the commemoration of the Lord's Supper. This act needs some context to understand why it was passed in 1852. I love this Courier and Ives print about the evils of drunkenness 
and this is called The Drunkard's Progress. And this image was made at the early onset of the temperance movement in the United States. And I would just like to share with you, in case you can't see this clearly on our screen, the nine steps of the drunkard's progress. So we see step one here of the man tilting back the glass, and it says, a glass with a friend. Step two, a glass to keep the cold out. Three, uh, a glass too much. Four, drunk and riotous. Step five, the summit attained jolly companions, a confirmed drunkard. And then we have the descent, poverty and disease, forsaken by friends, desperation and crime, and then the ultimate ignominy, death by suicide, leaving a child and a widow to mourn who look like they will be on their way to the poorhouse. It was very much promoted at this time that the ideal couple wed, who would wed one another would take the temperance pledge. So we see here a woman wearing her badge, the gentleman with his sash. They are the ideal temperate couple. And when you look at the difference in stature between the woman and the man at this time, I think it's very reminiscent of the public images that we would see of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, that although this was the United States, uh, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were held up as models of domestic bliss. This is another image widely circulated at the time, calling it the fruits of temperance. So we here in the background, we see a man returning from the factory, interestingly, in his top hat. He is being greeted by his children, his wife in the doorway, and this is very much of what the ideal was to promote temp temperance and abstinence from alcohol. And there were many instances of why temperance was so widely advocated. And here we have an address from the Rutland Weekly Herald in March of 1855 uh, about the vice of temperance, written by Reverend Aldous Walker. And he wrote, Intemperance is a calamity and a mother of calamities. It is a crime and a mother of crimes. It is a calamity to the inebriate himself as he brings him under the power of a vicious appetite and ordinarily leads to poverty, suffering, and an early death, etc. And for the next 50 years, this was the law of the land in Vermont, although smuggling was widespread. And as I have looked at House of Corrections, admissions papers, court cases, one of the prevailing offenses for arrest in the 1870s and 80s was um, the manufacture of alcohol raids and many people being arrested for public intoxication. And uh, Rutland itself was very vulnerable to this because of our proximity to Whitehall, New York, and there was a good deal of smuggling and traffic back and forth between Whitehall, where alcohol was illegal, and Rutland, where it was not. The person who changed um, all of this was Percival W. Clement a distinguished Vermont politician, public figure, um, Marble Company president, publisher of the Rutland Herald. In 1902, um, he ran for governor. And he was the first person to widely promote the ban of prohibition. And I think it's good to hear what 
this man had to say about prohibition and what his platform was in 1992 is he ran for governor. He wrote, the function of government is to control the individual as little as possible, allowing him the greatest freedom in all directions and limiting his action where it interferes with the rights of others. We don't dispute that intemperance is a vice, but prohibition does not supply the remedy. We are not all endowed with the same moral perceptions. Thank God for that. And the question of what constitutes intemperance must be settled by each individual for himself. What could be intemperance in one person would be temperance in another. A man may go through his whole life eating moderately, smoking moderately, drinking intoxicating liquors moderately, in fact taking all the pleasures and business of life in moderation. He is a temperate man. On the other hand, a man may be a glutton, intemperate in nature and action, a crank in his ideas on all subjects, but if he is a teetotaler, the prohibitionist calls him a temperate man and dominates the other as being intemperate. Now, as convincing as Percival Clement's appeal was, he did not get elected in 1902. And primarily, his reason for opposing the abolition of liquor in Vermont is he did not think it was good for business. And although he lost that three-way gubernatorial election, the law was changed in 1902. What Clement specifically advocated for was the local option. And this is what the new law said, that it would be up to each town and municipality to decide what they would do about regulating the sale of alcohol in that community. And this appeared in the Rutland Herald in 1902, and it's a sample of the ballot that would be put forth in each town, an act to regulate the traffic in intoxicating liquor, section one, the term intoxicating liquor is used in this act shall be held to include spirituous or intoxicating liquor, malt, liquors, lager beer, fermented wine, um, etc. And actually this is a little bit later than I thought. Uh, it's 1905, not 1902. And then the box that needed to be checked was, shall license be granted for the sale of intoxicating liquors in this town? And the voter, men only at this time, would check yes or no. And what we see as a consequence of this change in the law, uh, we see for the first time in more than 50 years, um, alcohol advertisements in the Rutland Herald. And here we have a Schlitz, the family beer ad. And you can see two gentlemen here looking rather convivial. And the visitor says, does your whole family drink beer? And the host says, just Schlitz. Our physician says that Schlitz beer is good for them. In another instance of an ad made before the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Law of 1906, we have this ad for, quote, the three ages of man. In childhood, middle life, and old age, there is a frequent need of the tonic properties that are contained in Amheuser Bush's malt neutrine. It is nature's greatest assistant, not a dark beer, but a real malt extract. 
This would be regulated after 1906. Now we come to the 18th Amendment. And what we have to remember, as we discussed in our show, about the passage of the 19th Amendment, women's right to vote, is that these constitutional amendment, amendments must be seen in the larger context of the progressive era wherein the United States government felt that national legislation needed to be passed to improve the quality of people's lives. And it's no accident than when there were grain rations during World War I that this gave the fuel for the passage of this amendment. So we note that the 18th Amendment was passed by Congress on the 18th of December, 1917. Uh, it was ratified on the 16th of January, 1919. And of course, we'll get to this a little bit later, it would be repealed early in the days of FDR's presidency. Section 1 of this constitutional amendment reads, after one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within, the importation thereof into, or the exportation thereof from the United States in all territory subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. This is the amendment. The law that executed this amendment was called the Volstead Act. In newspapers throughout the 1920s, we often see uh, the Volstead Act uh, re being referred to. And this clarifies the penalties and the definitions of what intoxicating liquor is. As defined here, it includes alcohol, brandy, so my grandmother was in violation of the law, whiskey, rum, gin, beer, ale, porter, wine, um, etc. And once again, the exceptions to this were nothing in this title shall be held to apply to the manufacture, sale, transportation, distribution of wine for sacramental purposes or like religious rites. And then this was a great loophole during Prohibition. No one but a physician holding a permit to prescribe liquor shall issue any prescription for liquor. So there is much in popular culture that has been said about the way that this law impacted life in the 1920s. And much of the oral history uh, has been lost. But we have some very, very telling clippings from the Rutland Herald. And one of the, the great ironies of prohibition is that the widespread perception is that it led to an increase in alcoholic behavior. So we have this clipping from 1922 about the great increase in drunkenness. And it says, total of 125 arrests in the city for offense nearly equals pre-Volstead records. And we have the statistics about how this amendment, instead of curbing alcoholic behavior, actually increased it. And we have all sorts of personal reasons for people's protest against prohibition. And some of this was not founded so much on belief in whether or not alcohol was evil, but it's more about personal uh, liberty. So one of the many articles that denounced the Volstead Act is a man named Jeremiah Durek uh, of Fairhaven, who says that the law is infamous, and he says it's a lying law. The infamous law puts the man found with a vial of wine on his person in the same class 
as if running away with another man's wife and a great deal more liable to be prosecuted. The infamous law that puts the housewife who makes a few quarts of dandelion wine in the same class as a criminal. And at the same time that people protested against the wide-reaching arm of the Volstead Act, there were perhaps um, not so much an equal, but a very strong and vocal, vocal cry against people who once again felt that the law should not be repealed and that the enemies of the Volstead Act were perhaps getting too much press. Now what I have to mention here is, what, here's one of the great ironic twists of history. When the Volstead Act was being implemented in 1919, finally, after at least two attempts to become governor of Vermont, Percival Clement found himself as governor of Vermont at a time that the law of the land was against alcohol. Also, one of the things that has to be seen in context, at the same time that states were ratifying the 19th Amendment for women's suffrage, Percival Clement voted against it. He voted against women's suffrage on the basis that if women had the right to vote, they would vote for prohibition. Clement was only a one-term governor, retiring in 1921 back to his many and varied business interests. I think it's interesting to peruse the Rutland Herald's letters to the editors because we have the way that all of this is portrayed in history books, but when you see a slice of life from the general public, we have a better perception of how this plays out in our community. And I love the tone of this particular letter for strongly expressing a point of view. To the editor of the Herald, fine business making Rutland dry by enforcing the Volset Act. Since when? When was Meadow Street dried up? How long since those private numbers were changed and the purveyors of everything in the original wrapper were put out of business? Some of them have been sent over the road due to the alertness of our state's attorney in getting the jump on their learned counsel, but it will be a long time before they get caught that way again. Is there really a dry spot in Rutland outside of the churches and public buildings? And how about all those private kegs back of the kitchen stove waiting for the grape juice to do the Noah act and brighten the corner where they are? How about all those private stunts and making home brew that tastes better than the old time lager after it is, after it is aged a little? And obviously the person who wrote this did not sign their name to the letter. And I also like this little poem that was published in the Rutland Herald in 1932 called The Home View of Prohibition. You may talk about the platform and broadcast through the air, but you'll always find a dark horse a hiding here or there. I'm not for prohibition, although I have four sons. I'd like to see them happy, but not on poison rum. Just let them have a little beer or perhaps a glass of wine to take the worry off their minds for these gall darn hard times. And someone out there may be able to tell us who HSP is of Cuttingsville, who evidently wrote a lot of poems that he sent in to the Rutland Herald. By 1932, people across the nation, already in the third year of the Depression, were fed up with the 18th Amendment, and it became a real 
uh, election issue in the election of 1932. Here is the ad from the Rutland Herald about the voting for the repeal of the 18th Amendment. And we see that uh, once again the forces pro and con very much in the same way that as it became evident that the women's suffrage amendment would be passed, the opponents of that made a last ditch effort. And once again, we see a headline here that drives make last fight in a repeal for the uh, repeal of prohibition. Prohibition forces battling back hard to hold back the flood of liquor. And of course, the people for prohibition were called dries, and the people who were anti-prohibition were called wets. And this was very much a campaign issue in the election of 1932. So here we have a bumper plate of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his vice president, John Nance Garner, and it's very clear in this election of 1932 exactly what they stand for. And although the constitutional amendment, the 18th Amendment, was repealed, there was a warning that was carried in Vermont newspapers. Despite repeal, Vermont is dry, Passing of the federal prohibition today does not mean intoxicating liquors can be brought into the state without incurring penalties. And this person who wrote the article, Colonel Lauren Pierce of Woodstock, explained that until the state legislature, town by town, um, ordered a repeal, that it would still be a violation to be drinking liquor. And of course, we all know uh, how this was resolved. And a headline in the Rutland Herald on March 6, 1935, has the title of Very Wet. Strong approval of the sale of liquor was registered throughout our, the county today. And it goes on to say that Rutland City in town, West Rutland, Fairhaven, Brandon, and Pittsford cast the largest wet vote. So these were the towns that voted to end prohibition, but it came up to a matter of local authority to determine how alcohol would be regulated in various Vermont towns. So we see here a ballot option in 1934 of 150 places in Vermont that would be voting about the local option as to how alcohol and the sale of alcohol would be dispensed with in their town. And here we have in the city of Rutland itself how the debate raged about where the beer parlor sites would be restricted. And the board limited licenses, first class licenses, to places inside the fire district. And as our presentation winds down, here is an ad from the Rutland Herald in 1935 that points to what I would say is a precursor to sports bars, <laughs> wherein we see, listen in on the World Series over the radio at these popular beer restaurants. So you can see some of the names and locations of it. So this is what brings to an end the chapter about prohibition here in Vermont. And once again, I thank you for listening in, watching our broadcast today, and we look forward to the resuming of more live Historically Speaking episodes in months to come.